After surrendering his spirit on the cross, Jesus embarked on a transcendental journey that would echo through the centuries, leaving people in awe. The book of Luke paints a captivating narrative of his final journey, starting with the moving prayer in Gethsemane. It was at this crucial moment that Jesus' faith in God strengthened, culminating in the iconic declaration, It is finished. As his lifeless body was removed from the cross and placed in a nearby tomb, the intriguing question arose, where was Jesus' spirit during the three days between his death and resurrection? A heated debate unfolded over whether he descended to hell, Hades, or ascended to heaven. This dispute, more than a mere matter of location, represents the intrigue that permeates the mystery of the three days that challenged human understanding of life after death. Another passage that often intrigues us is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 to 21. These verses stand out as one of the most enigmatic and fascinating passages in the New Testament, revealing Jesus as the epitome of suffering for the good. He personifies the painful journey intended to lead us to God, restoring broken and lifeless hearts. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive in the spirit. After being made alive, he went and made proclamation to the imprisoned spirits, to those who were disobedient long ago when God waited patiently in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. In it, only a few people, eight in all, were saved through water, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you also, not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience toward God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. In these verses, we are led to contemplate the grandeur of Christ's sacrifice, as the righteous endured suffering for the unrighteous. This noble purpose transcends earthly injustice, aiming to unite us with God. 1 Peter 3.18, 21 illuminates this path, narrating how Christ, dead in the flesh, was made alive in the spirit. An intriguing episode unfolds as Jesus in the Spirit proclaims to the imprisoned souls who once disobeyed in the days of Noah. During the construction of the ark, God's patient waiting was rewarded, saving a few through the water, symbolizing a redemption corresponding to baptism, an expression of the believer's new life in Christ. This baptism, instead of merely purifying the body, is a plea to God for a clear conscience. The resurrection of Jesus Christ mentioned here is more than surface cleansing. It is a living demonstration of the believer's faith. Despite Jesus' physical death, his spirit was resurrected by the Holy Spirit, an eloquent testimony to divinely ordained suffering. After his death, Jesus undertook an extraordinary mission by preaching to the spirits in prison. These were disobedient spirits, imprisoned in the depths of Hades, the realm of the dead. With the assistance of the Holy Spirit, Jesus delivered his message between the moment of his death and resurrection, entering the domain beyond life as we know it. The image of Jesus proclaiming the message of redemption even among the captives of Hades evokes fascination and deep reflection. When considering the ultimate authority of this world, the answer according to the Bible is clear. Even those residing beneath the earth in the darkest depths must acknowledge Jesus as their supreme Lord. This powerful statement reminds us of the absolute control that Jesus exercises over all things. Though a humbling idea, it also brings hope and comfort, knowing that we have a loving and almighty Lord. The passage in Philippians chapter 2 verse 10 echoes this supremacy, revealing that, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, whether in heaven, on earth, or under the earth. We contemplate the grandeur of creation by acknowledging the unparalleled sovereignty of Jesus Christ, the vision of all those under the earth closing their eyes and imagining a miraculous awakening driven by the power of Christ seems like a scene from an engaging novel. The profound symbolism of this act goes beyond words and actions, requiring complete submission to Jesus. The scene of bowed knees and confessing tongues is a vivid representation of total surrender to him, both in words and actions, a demand that extends to everyone. Imagine a grand scene where individuals from all walks of life converge. Their tongues confess, 
and their knees bend in complete submission to Jesus. This vision is powerful, conveying a deep connection, a unified belief, and an unwavering faith that calls us to surrender completely to Him. It is not just about verbal proclamations, but also tangible actions. The notion of surrendering completely to Jesus is simultaneously humble and empowering, offering inspiration to live more meaningful lives. This total surrender to Jesus is something that can propel us to live more fully thanks to the complete recognition of His divinity. Many people envision that this scenario will unfold formally at the final judgment when all creatures, whether in heaven or hell, will be compelled to kneel and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. This vision, while imposing reverence, is also a call to hope and certainty that, in the end, the sovereignty of Jesus will be unquestionable. The identity of the spirits in prison emerges clearly. They are those who, in the time of Noah, were disobedient. The narrative of 1 Peter 3.18.21 leads us to an intriguing reflection on who these rebellious spirits were. Interpretations vary, and while most of 1 Peter is accessible, these specific verses face a challenge. There are at least 314 different interpretations. The scripture asserts that Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit, and that he preached to those who were disobedient in the days of Noah. Later, Peter reveals that the good news of salvation was proclaimed even to those who had already died. This biblical mystery, presented in 1 Peter 4, 6, suggests the possibility of life in the Spirit, contrary to the conventional belief that such an experience is impossible after death. For this is the reason the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the Spirit. While many scriptures indicate that redemption after death is unlikely, some have mistakenly interpreted these verses to support the idea of more chances for redemption in the afterlife. This passage challenges the traditional conception that death marks the beginning of an insurmountable abyss. Here, surprisingly, Jesus preached to those who had already passed, challenging our conventional understanding of life between his death and resurrection. This episode suggests that somehow Jesus remained active and conscious during this mysterious period. The accounts suggest that during the days between death and resurrection, not only did Jesus remain fully conscious, but the individuals with whom he communicated were actively and consciously involved in this intriguing communication. There is a notable scarcity of discussions about what happened on Saturday, the holy day of the week. The focus usually extends from Friday to the crucifixion to the Sunday of the resurrection. Few report the events of Saturday, leading to a gap in our understanding. The common belief is that Jesus was inactive and unconscious during this interval as his body remained in the tomb. However, it is crucial to note that despite his physical body being in the tomb, his spirit remained vibrant and active. One can imagine Peter, on the first Easter Sunday, standing face to face with Jesus and inquiring about where he had been. Surprisingly, Jesus reveals that he was not on earth, but in Hades, the realm of the dead. Jesus' response about his activity during this period is even more fascinating. He was preaching to those who perished in Noah's flood. For Jesus, death represented the complete experience of its stages. He was an embodied spirit, dying on the cross, surrendering his spirit to God, and finally his body was laid in the tomb. At the same time, his spirit continued to exist, preaching to the disobedient who died in Noah's flood. On the morning of Easter Sunday, body and spirit were reunited, and Jesus remained fully conscious, able to communicate during all these extraordinary stages. There are various interpretations regarding the message that Jesus delivered to those spirits. Some believe that this message was aimed at a specific generation, granting them a second chance after the Great Flood. However, this perspective is shared by only a few, and most agree that there is no indication in the Bible that other generations would receive a similar chance. This post-Diluvian generation could theoretically accuse God of injustice, arguing that they were wiped out and then promised not to repeat their mistakes. Another intriguing interpretation suggests that the spirits to whom Jesus addressed 
could be demonic beings. If these spirits mentioned in 1 Peter 3.19 were indeed fallen angels, it is plausible that they were imprisoned due to a grave sin before the flood, in which he went and proclaimed to the spirits in prison. Peter, by referencing Noah's flood in verse 20, prompts reflection on the nature of the sin that led to this spiritual imprisonment. This view adds a layer of mystery to the narrative, suggesting that the spirits in question were involved in significant transgressions before the flood. If these mentioned spirits were indeed fallen angels, the message proclaimed by Jesus could not have been an offer of redemption because as Hebrews chapter 2 verse 16 clarifies, Christ did not come to help fallen angels. Redemption is not a possibility for them. Jesus' proclamation in this context likely declared his victory over Satan and his hosts, as revealed in 1 Peter 3.22. He who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him, he ascended to heaven and is at the right hand of God, occupying a place of honor and authority, with all angels, authorities and powers subjected to him. These spirits then represent a wicked generation, and Jesus' message symbolizes his supremacy over the evil forces that were once active among Noah's descendants. Imagine a generation so enraged that they rejected a message that could have saved lives, resulting in their tragic death in a catastrophic flood. This event serves as a stark reminder of the devastating consequences of sin. According to the Word, these people were disobedient, rebellious, invincible, and unbelieving. The weight of their sin is aggravated by the fact that God, in His patience and long-suffering, offered them 120 years of warnings while Noah built the ark. However, they remained obstinate in their unbelief and rebellion. The result was drowning in the flood, with their spirits cast into the prison known as hell. On the other hand, Noah and his obedient family were saved in the ark due to their faith. This narrative highlights not only divine justice, but also the importance of faith and obedience in the face of adversity. The peculiarity of this passage lies in its author, Peter. Known for his warm empathy, Peter was originally called Simon, a common name. However, upon meeting Jesus, he was given the name Peter, which means rock. This name change symbolized the character transformation that Jesus saw in him. Initially, Peter was like a reed in the wind, but after following Jesus, he became as firm as a rock. He was one of the first people called by Jesus to follow him, demonstrating how the grace and presence of Christ can completely transform a life. Peter, the first name in all lists of the Twelve Apostles, also acted as the unofficial spokesperson for the group. The Gospels paint a clear picture of Peter's complex character, which was charming, anxious, impulsive, and energetic. However, these strong qualities were accompanied by weaknesses, including his instability, inconsistency, and moments of cowardice. But why did Peter choose this specific moment to write? Perhaps it's helpful to pause and consider the fundamental line of thought that permeated this entire letter. It was written amid a backdrop of widespread persecution, addressing Christians facing difficulties because of their faith and testimony. In the midst of these adversities, they might be wondering why, if the Christian faith were true, they were experiencing so much suffering. Why were so few people following them if Christianity were the true faith? It's in this context that Peter references Noah, the faithful preacher who warned people for over a hundred years about the imminent destruction of the world by water. Despite Noah's warnings, people scorned and rejected him. However, at the time of the flood, God saved Noah and his family, validating, in the global context of history, Noah's unwavering faith. This narrative resonates as a powerful reminder that, even in the face of unbelief and rejection, faithfulness to God's message is vindicated in the course of history. The truth is not always popular, and throughout history the majority has not always been right. The impact of realizing that true believers are a minority can be unsettling. Consider the days of Noah, where only eight people were saved. Today, amid millions, the fact that there are only a few true believers does not diminish the truth of their faith. It wasn't the ark that saved them in Noah's days, 
it was God's judgment that brought them to safety. The Ark, in this context, is a vivid representation of the Lord Jesus Christ, while the Flood represents divine judgment. Just as the Ark was the only means of salvation during the Flood, Christ is the only way of salvation. Those in Christ are as saved as God can make them, while those outside are utterly lost. The Ark served as a safe haven for those who faced the waters of judgment, subject to the full force of the storm. Similarly, Christ endured the fury of judgment against our sins. For those in him there is no judgment. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. John chapter 5 verse 24. Imagine the ark surrounded by water, with it falling from the sky and encircling it. A powerful scene that, on the other hand, carries a deep hope for believers. Just as believers traverse the sea to a safe place in a renewed creation, those who place their faith in the Savior are safely transported through a scene of death and destruction to the place of resurrection and new life. This journey, permeated by God's faithfulness and protection, reflects the wonderful reality of salvation in Christ. The exact reason why Jesus preached to the confined spirits remains shrouded in mystery. Presumably, it was a way to proclaim God's message, but the specific content of this message has not been revealed to us. The only specific reference is to the disobedient in the days of Noah. The purpose or outcome of this preaching is not clearly stated, leaving room for our own conclusions, but without dogmatic rules. Three days after his death, something extraordinary happened. Body and spirit were reunited and Jesus rose from the dead. Jesus' resurrection knew no hindrance. Neither death nor the grave could hold him. This resurrection is an unprecedented event in human history. Unlike some who were resurrected only to die again, Jesus, raised by the Holy Spirit according to Romans 6 verse 4, will not experience death again. Jesus' resurrection is presented as a work of the triune God. In John chapter 2 verses 18 to 22, Jesus prophesies about his own resurrection, referring to the temple of his body. When challenged by the Jews, he responds, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews misunderstand, thinking of the physical temple, but Jesus is referring to his own body. When he rose from the dead, his disciples remembered these prophetic words, further solidifying their faith and trust in him who conquered death. Scriptures and words spoken by Jesus have a tangible impact on the physical world. The spiritual world may seem complex and enigmatic, but when Jesus died and rose, we witnessed immediate results in the physical realm. Matthew narrates a singular event not recorded in the other Gospels. Tombs opened, and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised. Jesus' resurrection triggered the exit of these saints from their tombs, and after Jesus' resurrection, they entered the holy city, appearing to a great number of people. It's intriguing to note that even earthquakes, capable of damaging stone tombs, do not explain the resurrection of the bodies. God's direct intervention is the only explanation for this extraordinary event, as emphasized in Matthew's narrative. In describing Jesus as the sacrifice on the cross that brings victory over death, Matthew uses the expression, those who had fallen asleep, to describe the resurrected people. This expression, common in the New Testament, refers to those who died but have a secure eternal destiny. The resurrection of these saints highlights not only Jesus' victory over death, but also anticipates the hope and certainty of eternal life for all who believe in his redemptive work. The miraculous accounts of the resurrection of the saints and their appearance in Jerusalem are powerful testimonies of Jesus' accomplished work on the cross and his subsequent resurrection. The term holy people refers to devout individuals from the Old Testament era. We can draw a parallel with how Moses and Elijah were chosen to appear alongside Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration. In this specific case, the text speaks of the resurrection of the bodies of the saints, emphasizing that despite Jesus' judgment on the leadership of Israel and their condemnation, Israel still holds a significant place in God's plans.
This narrative aligns with the prophecies of Ezekiel, where the Supreme Lord promises to bring back to life those who perished in a valley where even the bones had become dust. God himself declares that he will open the graves, bringing his people back home to the land of Israel. This is a profound act of restoration where the Spirit of God is poured out on them, granting them renewed life. This prophecy is fulfilled, reaffirming the Lord's faithfulness to his word. By bringing to life those who are dry as bones, God accomplishes a remarkable resurrection, reminding us of his promise of restoration and renewal for his people. This is a testimony of Jesus' redemptive work, which not only conquered death, but also restored hope and life to those who believe. Matthew portrays this event without exaggeration, as its meaning is crystal clear. Derek Tidball emphasizes that the resurrection of these saints is an anticipation of the resurrection that all believers can expect through the death of Jesus. This is the dawn of a new day, an era where death has been overcome and resurrection to eternal life has become a concrete possibility. Although Matthew doesn't answer all the questions that may arise about these miraculous events, in narrating them, he provides a unified perspective. This is a supernatural testimony, confirming indisputably the identity of Jesus. These extraordinary events are not isolated facts, but integral parts of a cosmic narrative pointing to victory over death and the promise of eternal life for all who trust in Jesus' redemptive work. As for the current whereabouts of Jesus, we find the answer in the comforting words he shared with his disciples after the resurrection. Aware of the discomfort permeating their hearts, Jesus in John chapter 14 of the Gospel of John said, Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. These words carry a reassuring promise, inviting them to overcome fear and doubt, instilling confidence. Jesus acknowledged the anxiety hanging over them in the face of his imminent departure, but he encouraged them to maintain faith even when they wouldn't see him physically. The promise was clear. I'm going, but you will continue to believe in me. This statement not only calms troubled hearts, but also reveals a profound truth about Jesus' ongoing presence. Trust in God and in Jesus is an anchor for the disciples and by extension for all of us. Even when we don't see him physically, we are invited to maintain unwavering faith because Jesus' presence transcends visible limitations. This message resonates not only in that moment, but echoes through the centuries, inviting us to trust in the promise that he is with us, regardless of what we may see with our physical eyes. In the midst of Jesus' revealing conversations, a striking declaration about equality with God emerges. In the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verses 2 to 4, Jesus shares an extraordinary vision. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. These words transcend earthly understanding, pointing to a celestial destination where the Father's generosity is evident in many dwellings prepared for the redeemed. Jesus not only offers solace to troubled hearts, but also paints a celestial picture of abundance, ensuring that there will be space for everyone. It's as if he says, heaven is vast enough to welcome every redeemed soul, and if it were not so, I would have told you. In the face of this celestial perspective, Thomas, expressing the concern of many, asks Jesus about the way. In response, Jesus firmly states, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. These words resonate like a beacon, guiding not only Thomas but all of us to the understanding that access to the Father and true life is found exclusively through Jesus. Thus the Father's house, with its many rooms, becomes not only a promise of a celestial destination but a revelation of Jesus' singular role as the way that leads us to the fullness of life and proximity to the Father. In a revelation about celestial life, Jesus shares with his disciples a promise that transcends earthly comprehension. In my Father's house are many rooms. The term mansions, translated from ancient Greek, has a deeper richness when understood as dwelling places. This word suggests not just a place but a carefully prepared space, 
a celestial home thoughtfully planned. By employing the term dwelling places, Jesus evokes the idea of a welcoming place where every detail is carefully prepared. Like parents lovingly preparing a baby's room or hosts readying their home for guests, Jesus anticipates and organizes these dwellings with a love that transcends our understanding. His gesture is not just an act of provision, but an expression of deep affection for those he calls his own. In saying, I go to prepare a place for you, Jesus paints a picture of anticipated and welcoming love. He not only invites but demonstrates personal care as he goes ahead to ensure that each disciple has their unique celestial space. It's as if he says, you are loved and deserve a celestial home tailor-made for each of you. This vision not only promises a glorious destination, but reveals a savior who goes beyond, preparing a special place for each soul. It's a warm invitation, a gesture of love assuring us that, as the loving son, Jesus awaits us in celestial dwellings, eager to welcome us. Let's explore the extraordinary initiative and planning that Jesus himself orchestrated. He wasn't merely led to the cross, he chose this path. While many saw his death as an unforeseen calamity, Christ revealed that it was part of his divine plan. When Jesus was on earth, he not only promised to return shortly to his disciples, referring to his resurrection and the coming of the Holy Spirit, he had in mind a grand gathering of his people at the end of times. He wanted his followers to understand that his absence didn't mean the end, but rather a transition to a permanent place where he would dedicate himself to preparing a home for each one. Jesus' promise echoes, Where I am, you will be also. Here, the essence of heaven is intrinsically linked to him. It's not about golden streets, pearly gates, or even the presence of angels. Heaven is heaven because Jesus is there. Amid the uncertainties of life, we can find solace in the certainty that he not only prepares a place for us, but also prepares us for that place. It's an invitation to trust in his leadership, knowing that just as he is active in providing for our celestial future, he is also shaping our lives to fully enjoy that divine place. This inspiring verse makes it crystal clear that the Lord Jesus Christ not only points the way, he is the way to salvation. He is not merely a guide among many. He is the only route through which we can reach the Father and obtain salvation. Accepting this person as ours is a guarantee of salvation. In Christianity, everything boils down to Christ. The Lord Jesus is not just an option among several. He is the only way through which we can approach the Father, excluding any other. Christ is the truth. He's not just a teacher of truth, but the embodiment of it. Those who have Christ have the truth, and there is no other place where it is found. Jesus is life. He is the source of both spiritual and eternal life. Those who receive him have eternal life because he is the very essence of life. Reflecting on Thomas's words, Lord, we do not know where you are going. We can appreciate his sincere and clear confession. They presumed that Jesus was going to another place, as if it were just a change of city. However, Jesus was going to prepare a celestial place, a profound truth that Thomas was beginning to understand. Heaven is a wonderful home, and when we arrive at the Father's house, we are truly home. As Jesus promised, he is preparing our eternal home. The Lord will return in the clouds, and those who have died in faith will be resurrected. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 13 to 18, Paul shares words of comfort and hope about the resurrection. But we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore encourage one another with these words.
These words offer comfort and hope to believers, ensuring that death is not the end but the beginning of an eternity in the presence of the Lord. Jesus laid plans for the Holy Spirit to conclude the work he had begun. The scriptures show that Jesus' ascension was literal and bodily as he ascended to heaven and was received in a cloud before the eyes of his disciples and other onlookers. Two angels appeared and promised that Christ would return in the same way they saw him ascend. In Acts chapter 1 verse 11 the angels say, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. This ascension marked the end of the human limitations Jesus had during his earthly ministry. Some of the divine characteristics that were temporarily suspended during this time were now restored, and Jesus returned to his divine glory. The vision of Jesus in heaven is also indicated in Luke 22 verse 69, where he states that he will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Additionally, after his ascension, Stephen had a vision where he looked into the heavens and saw the glory of God, with Jesus standing at the right hand of God. The Bible affirms that Jesus currently resides in heaven, a realm of glory, the home of God, angels, and all the redeemed. According to scripture, Jesus is at the right hand of God the Father at this moment. Imagine encountering Jesus face to face. You might think it would be a wonderful day, but for Paul, before his conversion, it was one of the most challenging days of his life. Saul, a Pharisee of Pharisees, fervently persecuted the followers of Jesus. His conversion took place on the road to Damascus, where he had a vision of the resurrected Jesus. At that moment, Saul of Tarsus was likely around 30 years old and saw the growth of the Christian faith as a threat to his religion. Determined to destroy this perceived menace, he was traveling toward Damascus when suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice asking why he was persecuting him. Saul asked who the Lord was, and the response was, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men traveling with Saul heard a sound from heaven, but didn't understand the words like Saul did. They didn't see the Lord, but Saul had a unique vision calling him to apostleship. This moment marked Saul's significant transformation into Paul, the apostle who played a crucial role in spreading Christianity. The zealous Pharisee, now being led by the hand to Damascus, was blinded for three days. During this time he neither ate nor drank. Another man who witnessed Jesus in heaven is John the Apostle, as reported in the book of Revelation. The title of this book, Revelation, derives from the main event it describes, the manifestation of Jesus Christ to people living on earth in the last days. Revelation begins with John being caught up in spirit on the Lord's day. He heard a voice like a trumpet declaring, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches in Asia. John turned to see the voice and saw seven golden lampstands, in the midst of which was someone like the Son of Man, dressed in a long robe with a golden sash around his chest. John had seen the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, according to his account. The powerful voice he heard was identified as that of the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, who are at the beginning and end of everything. Jesus identified himself with these names in Revelation chapter 1 verse 18. We know that this was the loud voice of Jesus. The title Alpha and Omega belongs to the Lord Jehovah, the God of Israel. These titles convey the same idea of being the first and the last. This is a New Testament passage where Jesus clearly affirmed his divinity. We can only imagine what went through John's mind when he compared the sound of the voice he likely heard, which didn't perfectly match how he remembered Jesus' voice during his ministry on earth. John described the voice as a trumpet, but he knew it was Jesus because the voice identified itself as the Alpha and the Omega. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. Revelation chapter 1 verse 10. After so much time with Jesus throughout his earthly ministry, John finally had the opportunity to meet him face to face. The title, Someone Like a Son of Man, recalls the figure who would reign as the agent of God, as described in Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. 
I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days, and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. Additionally, Jesus' face shines like the sun, something that Greek and Jewish texts often associated with divinity, whether of angels or God himself. In Revelation chapter 1 verses 16 and 17, John describes that in Jesus' right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. The vision of Jesus reflects his majesty and glory, leading John to fall at his feet as though dead. However, Jesus comforted John, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the absolute deity. Although John was an apostle who knew Jesus while he was on earth, he was amazed to see this incredible vision. Even the three years that John spent on earth with Jesus didn't adequately prepare him for the moment when Jesus appeared to him in his celestial majesty. At that moment, John realized the divine power and majesty that Jesus had set aside while living on earth. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus states, I am the Alpha and the Omega, revealing his identity as the God of all eternity, the Lord of past and future eternity. Jesus also says, I am the one who is alive. I was dead, and now look, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and Hades. These titles confirm Jesus' divinity and his victory over death. To comfort John, Jesus touches him with compassion, perhaps providing a touch that felt more familiar than his celestial appearance. Jesus tells John not to be afraid as he is in the presence of Jesus, identified by three significant titles, the first and the last, the eternal God, and the one who is alive, who was dead, and now lives forever. Jesus, by possessing the keys of death and Hades, demonstrates his authority over death and eternal life. The victory that Jesus achieved over sin and death is eternal. He did not rise from the dead only to die again. Jesus is the only one who holds the keys to Hades and death. Some may mistakenly believe that the devil has the authority or power to decide who lives or dies, but they are deceived because only Jesus holds the keys to Hades and death. In Revelation chapter 1 verse 8, Jesus declares, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and goes on to affirm that he is the living one who was dead, and now is alive forever and ever, possessing the keys of death and Hades. This conversation is crucial as it represents the last personal encounter with Jesus recorded in the Bible. By possessing the keys of death, the risen Christ has control and authority over it. When Jesus died, releasing his spirit, he surprised Pilate demonstrating his authority over death. Furthermore, he has the power to free his followers from death so they can be with him forever. Analogously, keys are often used as symbols of authority and control. Those who possess the keys have the privilege to enter and access any area. In everyday life, keys symbolize ownership and power. When someone hands the key back to the owner, it signifies the return of control and possession. Jesus, by possessing the keys of death and Hades, symbolizes his supreme authority over life and death. Our Lord Jesus Christ remains supreme. The word Hades means the dwelling of spirits. In Luke 16 verse 26 it is mentioned, And besides all this, between us and you a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross over from there to us. It is Christ's key that closes the dwelling of lost spirits. Christ conquered death because he had no sin. The curse upon humanity in the Garden of Eden, brought by sin, was completely nullified by Christ. His victory over death has eternal implications for us. Christ's victory over death is fundamental to the good news of the gospel. Without the resurrection there is no gospel, and without the gospel there is no hope for us as emphasized in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 17. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Other texts in scripture foretold the desire that the Lord would abolish death. In Hosea 13 verse 14 it is written, I will ransom them from the power of the grave. I will redeem them from death. 
Where, O death, are your plagues? Where, O grave, is your destruction? Compassion will be hidden from my eyes. Isaiah 25 verse 8 also prophesies about the end of death. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from all the earth, for the Lord has spoken. It is essential to remember that the Father granted Jesus Christ the right to occupy the exalted position of authority and dignity as a reward for what he accomplished. Jesus conquered death and believers stand firm in Jesus' words and promises. Consider what he obtained in return for the humiliation he suffered at the hands of men. He was the servant of servants, but now he is the King of kings and Lord of lords. He stooped lower than the lowest and ascended higher than the highest. He wore the crown of thorns, but now he wears the crown of heaven. He was the servant of servants, but now he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Let's worship him. Let our hearts ponder these simple yet invaluable truths. Come and spread your treasures at his feet, and let's enthrone him as Lord over all that exists. The truth is that people fear one thing above all, and that thing is death. This is because to the world, death is an unknown. Unsaved people feel fear when considering what is to come. Will they have to answer for what they did or failed to do? Will they burn in hell forever? Or will they attain a state of eternal happiness? And make no mistake, hell is real, whether most people admit it or not. Death changes people's lives after their earthly lives end. However, Christians will enter a victorious march following Christ. There is no reason to fear for those who believe in Christ. This should make us say, let us worship the one who has the keys to hell and death. Let us enter his presence with thanksgiving and rejoice in him. As we reflect on the unshakable truths presented, we are confronted with the reality that death is not the end for those who believe in Jesus Christ. He who descended deeper in humility now reigns as the King of kings and Lord of lords, possessing the keys of death and hell. For followers of Christ, death is a door that opens into eternity, into victory. Therefore we need not fear but worship the one who conquered death and leads us in triumph. May these truths inspire our worship and propel us to live with the hope of eternity with our Savior. In Christ we find victory over the unknown and the promise of eternal life.